Welcome to the Unearthed Man Podcast, the journey becoming a conscious man, hosted by Milva. Hey all, Milva here, and welcome to episode 46 of the Unearthed Man Podcast. To kick off, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we work and gather, and their continuing connection to land and waters. I pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. I pay tribute to the diversity of First Nations peoples of Australia and their ongoing culture. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, then welcome aboard. If you're one of my regular listeners, then welcome back. I really appreciate your ongoing support. So if you are looking to know more about the Unearthed Man, then you can find me on Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. If you also feel called, it would be great if you can subscribe to the podcast via your preferred app and also leave a review. I know a lot of you enjoy the show, and therefore, if you could give, five, give back five minutes to leave a review, that would be gratefully welcomed. I love the chat with Michael Unbroken last week. He's a prime example of someone who's truly taken accountability for his life, not allowed his childhood traumas to dictate who he is, and is now an inspiration for thousands of people who are looking to move beyond their own challenges. I think I say this about all my guests, however, I'd love to chat further with him as there are many uncovered topics. In relation to my guest today, he's another that reached out via Podmatch. I'm so glad that I followed my intuition. As far as all, as so far, all the guests that I've come up, have come via that channel have been fantastic. I've no doubt that my guest today will be the same. For the first 15 years of, for the first 15 years of my guest career, he rose through the corporate ranks earning awards, executive titles, and excelled at winning. It was in 2014 when he realized the negative impact of winning on his company, teams, family, and self. This resulted in my guest going through his own evolution. His passion is transformation. His purpose is to help those seeking personal or organizational change. Today, my guest helps others others transform into the people, leaders, teams, and companies they aspire to be. By using approaches that blend behavioral science, spirituality, and the outdoors, my guest helps these clients remove self-imposed barriers and beliefs, leading to sustainable success through emotional intelligence coaching. He's an award-winning certified professional coach, former International Coaching Federation board member, and an avid outdoorsman. He's volunteered his services to support multiple youth-based organizations, including Thrive, Future Five, Connecticut Spartans Elite, and multiple individuals between the ages of 18 to 22. Welcome to the Unearthed Man podcast, Brian Clay. Hey, Brian, how are you, mate? I'm good, Melbourne. How are you doing? Mate, I'm fantastic. Thank you. Thanks again for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So in, in the bio, we talked about the fact of um, I live in the corporate world. So my day job is you know, living and breathing in the world of corporate. Um, I've often joked around with a few people that I'm becoming more of a corporate monk than actually operating in corporate so it sounds like you and I have some uh, very familiar things. So let's take a step back. You know, what did that look like for you from a, a corporate point of view? You know, that, I know, I suppose that desire to be out there to win sounds like to win at all costs and everything else. So can you talk me through that sort of the, the younger part and the starting of uh, your life and the career? Sure. So I'll, 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 I'll go back. I'll, I'll start with the, the career and then we can go you know, even farther back in the childhood, if, if, if you'd like. But uh, from a from a career standpoint, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll admit, um, I hated the concept of school. Like growing up, I hated being in school. I, I went there and I did it because it's what you had to do. And so, you know, and I, and I grew up in the, in the, you know, in the 70s and the 80s, graduated in, in 90. So I'm, you know, it, it was it, during that era. It was it was all about the you know, concept of knowledge is power and, and having um, having self determination and you know you know get out of your house, um, mm-hmm. get out from underneath your parents' wing and, and get out there and, and start living. And, and you know college wasn't the thing I was interested in. I was I was inter- interested in going out and you know getting my jobs, earning my money, and and, and getting out on my own. Yep. Um, and so right out of high school, I went and my, my career started actually at a at an insurance company where. I worked in a machine room and, you know, I was, you know, you know, even when I was, was young growing up, um, I was always, I was always striving to be competitive and be better than the person standing next to me. Yep. It didn't matter whether it was in sports, um, in school, when I cared about a class, it was about that. 
um, racing to see who could who could get a test on the fastest. I was I was heavily active in in athletics, and so it it drove and it, and it was fed through that. And so when I when I graduated high school, went into this job, that was the first thing that uh, that 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 I did was was realized it was, you know, I had a boss, and now it was I was happy to learn from the boss, but I also realized that I was going to be competing with this boss when it came time for reviews. Mm -hmm. um, how well are you doing? Right. You want praise from your boss. You want praise from others. Um, you're competing against that boss, but I also had a machine I was competing against, mm -hmm. um, because I was, you know, my job was to, was to get in, you know, to get, uh, uh, policies into this machine. And, and the goal was to see how fast I could do it. Okay. Yep. And so I would try to beat the machine by turning the machine up as fast as it could go. Um, to the point to where it was, it was something where it was on the break of breaking the machine, right? It was on the brink of breaking this okay. machine, but I wanted to go as fast as I could. Um, so I did that. But after about two years, I realized that, that living, <laughs> living the life of a machine operator wasn't going to get me out of my parents' basement. Yep. Uh, so, so I decided that, that I was going to do the thing I hated the most, which was go back to school. Um, and so I went to college and, and actually found college to be, um, you know, one of the best experiences of my life as, as far as, you know, at that point in time, you know, I, I look at it and, you know, I went in at 20 instead of 18 and, you know, I was, I was ready to, to go in and, and, and do well in college. So, yeah. you know, what I found in college though, was it was very difficult to compete against 500, 600 people in a classroom. Yeah. And at the beginning, my grades weren't all that strong. Um, and I had to look at myself and say, all right, your competition is you now mm. compete against yourself. It's it's time for you to actually start doing um, what you came here to do, and when I did that, my sophomore year turned everything around and and came out, you know, came out of college, um, you know, into back into the insurance industry, okay. um, but this time in a different role. And uh, when I was there, right, so again, it's we're, we're talking mid '90s, and a lot of the focus in the mid '90s is still around knowledge, right? Yeah. So so you're 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 viewed, you're judged, you're um, you're giving your your next assignments based on performance. It was all merit based. Yeah, and it had nothing to do with whether or not um, you know. Yes, people were interested in whether they liked you or not. That got you to invited to maybe some after parties or things of that nature. But your performance in the job and getting the job done was was key and critical. Mm. And because it was a knowledge based job and an outcomes based job, um, I learned very quickly what type of outcomes the company was looking for. Um, and I wound up, you know, competing against co corporate, corporate standards, corporate guidelines. Yeah, yeah. And my goal was to beat them. Right. So if, if, if the goal was to do X by, by Y, I wanted to do it by Y minus three. Yes. Yep. And then it would be Y minus four. And so I would keep, keep pushing that. If, if the knowledge that was needed was, was, you know, was book one, I would gain the knowledge of book one through three. Yeah. And yep. So it was perpetual competition, but in but in doing and, and in doing, I won't say but, but and in doing so, while I was doing that, um, you get recognition, you get promotions, you get put on special committees, and within the organization, as as you stay there, and and again in the '90s, you you know in early 2000s, you you could build a career in an organization. Mm -hmm. You wind up getting promoted, yeah. Um, and and as that occurred, I was getting promoted, being put in manager positions, being put on on projects with senior vice presidents and things of that nature, um, and always being as you were being put on this and you were you were getting that reward, um, you continued to, you know, I continued to look at it and say, well, these are the behaviors the organization wants. These are the behaviors that are successful, yep. and and for me, those behaviors weren't just competition, um, you know, competitive against the corporation. It was being able to show within the organization um, how much I knew and how much I could get done. Um, and the I part was always, yes, I'm on a team, but I'm on the team or I'm leading the team or, um, you know, that, that was the, the mantra. And so, you know, that was, that was, that was basically the early career um, up until, up until about 2010, where the company I worked for, decided it was going to start breaking itself apart. Yeah. And I realized that wasn't an organization to be at anymore. And I had to now leave that company and for the first time, start going to other organizations. And uh, the interesting part was, as I started to go to these other organizations, when they looked at my my resume and talked with me, 
Um, they gave me even higher level positions walking right. into them, higher level jobs, um, more pay, which was, you know, which was a driving factor, more titles, more prestige, all feeding the concept of this is what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, there's, there's some interesting things. So there's a, a common theme, obviously, that runs through, through all that. And, um, yeah, and based on all the other, the, the conversation I've had with the other men is what's the driver of the need of the validation and the competition? So I know at the start you said, hey, let's start with a career, but maybe we'll go back to the childhood. So, so mm-hmm. for me, there feels that there's something that's, that you either was missing or something that hadn't taken place because the so the number of men that I speak to, and, and like I'm one of them, right? I I am super competitive. Like I compete against my own son, and and I look back now, like I'm doing sprint races with my own son on the beach because I knew I could beat him, right? And that's 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 that level of competition and drive. But now I'm spending time going back, going, hmm, where's all that come from? And I realize it is all the way back into my childhood about growing up with two other brothers. And the only way to be recognized, the only way to be seen, the only way to get the validation is to compete. And you work out where's that competition. So what does that look like for you? So we will continue on because I know that there's obviously yeah, an yeah. aha moment in your career, but let's double back. Why? What happened with you that you felt was the driver of all those, and then we can start to progress forward after you're moving up through and everything else. So it's it's interesting, right? So so I'll go back to I think it for me is born with it. Hmm. Okay. Um. And 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 I'll and I'll give you some reasons why. And these are these are these are things that have been been given to me by my parents and by my family members and by my grandmother. Um. So first and foremost, I was an only child. I not an only. I was the firstborn child. So I didn't have the competition at the beginning, right? I didn't have brothers and sisters I was mm. competing with. Um, I actually didn't have to compete with anybody okay. um, for, for attention or affection um, um, for the first three years of my life. Mm. And so and so, what when I'm told about the stories about me as a kid, so when I was born, I was born with um, what's called hip dysplasia. And, and you know, what wound up mean was that my hip sockets weren't fully formed mm. and they had to put a brace on me as a, as, as a baby so that, I, so that the balls would, would, would create the actual socket for you. Mm. Um, and, you know, my parents would talk about how, you know, I would see other people doing things and I would be pushing myself to do them, not necessarily for, for gratification, you know, because my parents were not one of those types of families that did the pat on the back or, you know, Again, we're talking very early '70s. Yeah. Um, it, that concept wasn't wasn't mainstream yet. Doctor Spock wasn't mainstream yet. It yeah. was it was you know you know parents were more in the uh, um, you were you were more likely to get to get negative um, affirmation than you were to get positive affirmation. Yes. But what I saw was other people doing things, and I wanted to do that. Okay. Um, and and you know when I when when I when I, I hear those stories about when I was younger. That was, that was a dry, that was a potential driver. Um, it's funny because I did get two brothers um, and I became very competitive against both of those brothers, not because I wanted my parents to tell me I was doing well, not because I was looking for an external group to come and say, congratulations. Mm. It was because me personally, I didn't want to lose. Like, yeah. I, I yeah. took it personal. It was internal. Yes. Um, you know, and, and, and that was from the time that I was, you know, first introduced and, and my, my parents always told me the story about, you know, when my brother was finally able to sit up, I would walk over and just knock him over <laughs> like, like, not, and, and he was just sitting there and I just walk up and knock the kid over. Um, I'm three, he's like six months and, you know, yeah. and then I just walk away as if to say, you're not catching me. You know, you're, you are not going to get where I am. And I, you know, and I recall that, you know, I don't recall that aspect, but, you know, when you get told it enough, you know, you know, it's real. But I do know that as both of my brothers, um, you know, continue to get older and I got older, you know, I can recall a lot of those moments where mm. it wasn't because I wanted my parents to say your grades are better than his. It's just that I wanted my grades to be better than his. Yeah, so yeah. I've always looked at it and said, it's a, to me, it's always been an internal drive, right? You talk about masculine energies and things of that nature. Com- competition, competitiveness is one of those 
it's just one that I tapped into and I perpetually, I perpetually used um, and, and enjoyed using. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think that's an interesting um, aspect of it there. So, so what did, what was growing up? Because obviously it sounds like, you know, you're growing up, you end up having, you know, two other brothers and, and you're the oldest, um, you know, I'm the middle of, of, of the two. So, you know, I've well and truly documented the challenges that that put up for me, you know, <laughs> yeah. middle child syndrome. Um, <laughs> so, you know, so, so what does that then look like for you? I mean, if you've got this ongoing, you know, internal competition or this internal drive just to be successful or, or to be that, was there a point where that was you felt that was ever being curtailed? Was that being encouraged? Was that, you know, how did that look, look even with, with your own brothers? I mean, did that actually drive, you know, were they supportive of that? Did that drive factions? What did that look like as you were growing up from that aspect? Yeah, so so it drove, I mean, so it drove a lot, you know, when, when you start talking about, you know, as you get a little bit older and you start getting into school where you're getting grades, Mm. Um, and you start, and again, I was, I was heavily involved in sports. And so, um, you know, athletically I was, I was, I was, I was gifted as, as an athlete. I was very lucky. Um, I was typically almost always one of the fastest kids, if not the fastest kid in a, in a school, um, playing baseball. Um, you know, by the time I was 15, I could, I could throw a ball over 90 miles an hour, up near 90 miles an hour. Um, you know, from a, from a hitting perspective, you know, so, so the reason why I'm bringing it all up is that all of those types of results got you trophies mm. and, you know, you know, accolations put on special teams, traveling, um, talking to professional teams, um, you know, the things that you think uh, you, you want to be able to go towards. So, right. So, um, you know, with me and my family, my family isn't one where we're a bunch of a bunch of people who run around hugging tight. Um, even today, we're not a we're not a tight family. We're a, we're a loving family, mm. you know. And there was always that in the house. Um, but really, the family dynamic was more about making sure that you were safe and secure and provided for. Um, but my my growing up was very much my parents were very much a you figure it out. We're, we're going to let you go out. We're going to let you explore. We're going to help you where you might get stuck. And if you come to us for help, we'll, we'll do what we can. Um, but we're not going to, we're, we're, we're not going to, they were, my parents were very, very, very specific about trying not to favor one over the other. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, and so, um, and by the way, you know, my youngest brother, um, you know, he wasn't as strong in school. And they didn't expect it. So they, the other point was they never held us all to the same standards. They held us all to, they could tell whether or not we were giving our best. And their only push and their only ask was to do your best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it, it, so so within the within the brothers, yes, was there was there sometimes conflict? Absolutely. Um, your, your traditional brotherly conflict. You know, yep. three boys growing up, three to six years apart. Um, we never had the knockdown brawls that, uh, that, that, you know, you hear sometimes in families and, you know, but that's because I, that those were going on in school, mm -hmm. you know, that, that was outside the house. Um, and again, you know, for those who grew up during that time, the seventies and eighties, it, it probably would in the U S it wouldn't be a surprise to hear that, um, you know, and, and we grew up in a very, uh, mid, uh, very middle-class, very blue collar um, town that was in the process of becoming very diverse. Um, so, so you, 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 and again, this is very shortly within, um, within 15 years of the civil rights movement in the U S there still was a lot of, a lot of harbored, um, hatred actually with, within, yeah. within the, within the area. Um, and the re and again, the reason I'm bringing it up is that, you know, in, when you're in grade school, you know, you don't, you don't think about the fact that your, your friend, your friend is his parents are first generation from Mexico. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and he was. Um, I went over to the house and the mom and dad didn't speak English. Mm. They spoke Spanish. Um, and my friend, you know, he he spoke both, but I didn't know that. I didn't think anything of it. Mm. But once you start getting to seventh and eighth grade, you know, puberty starts to happen, and now you're competing not just, you know, for playtime on the on the playground, it's wait a minute. There's these things called girls. Yes. 
right? There's these things yeah. called girls. And all of a sudden you're competing with each other for things that you never you never were interested in before, but suddenly not only are you interested in them, but it becomes a um it becomes an external validation point. So in seventh, eighth, ninth grade, you know, growing up in the area that I grew up, making sure that you had the opposite sex interested in you was very important. Yes. Yep. And um there was a lot of domineering type behavior because that's what you did. And it, and again, it was very much proliferated through sports and activities. I mean, our gym class, we took wrestling, like real yeah, wrestling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, and you stayed in there regardless of weight class, you know, if, if you could beat the heaviest, biggest, strongest kid, then so be it. Um, but that was, that was the mindset. Uh, and that's mm. what, that's what you were, you were challenged with growing up, which was how do you not just survive, but thrive in that environment? And and I'll share that, you know, once high school hit, things changed completely. Okay. Um, I went from a, from, a, from a kid who did well in school, enjoyed school, um, you know, at least enjoyed getting, getting the grades in school to someone who no longer wanted to participate. Hmm. Um, high school where I grew up was, you know, 100% scary. Okay. What, what's the... Where'd that come from? It came from kids with guns in school, kids right. getting, getting, I mean, it, it, it was real scary. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there were, you know, when you're growing up, you're hearing the stories of what it's like in the high school. And you, you, you think it's, you know, first off, you have to go in and find out, is it real? Yep. And you, you know, there's, there's areas you're not even allowed to walk if you're, if you're not from a particular group. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, and and you go by it and you realize, yeah, this probably is not a place where I want to linger mm. uh, in the school. And and while I was there, you know, while I was in high school, America was, you know, in the U.S., a lot of things were transforming. And a lot of those yeah. um, a lot of those things that I saw when I was younger in, in middle school around around the hatred, around the violence, um, it was just exacerbated in the high school. And, uh, you know, you had you had real gangs. Mm-hmm. in the high yep. school again yep. in the 80s you know and uh and a lot of a lot of the adults were in denial about what was there mm. um, yep. but that denial allowed that thing to to fester and grow um and and like i said you know when i was a sophomore in high school uh in my homeroom class a person walked up to me and displayed the gun they were carrying Gosh. um and and so you know that's when reality hits in and mm. uh and at that moment in time I said, I don't want to be here anymore. This isn't, you know, because getting good grades in that school made you a target. Yeah. Being, yeah. being, um, ex- being on a sports team meant you were expected to, to drink, to do drugs, uh, to, to, to womanize. And that was expected. And so I dropped out of everything. So that's just not what I want to be. Yeah. yeah. But okay. I didn't know how to deal with it. Yeah, no, I can understand it. It's interesting as you're talking through that because the one one of the things that was popping up in my mind is how aligned um, societal trauma and individual trauma actually is. So if you think, if you don't deal with your own internal traumas, they're going to come out somewhere. There's going to be some explosion. There's going to be some anger. There's going to be some frustration that comes out because you're not actually going back and looking at it and dealing with it in closing the eyes and, and it's it's starting to happen here in Australia, which is really sad, like 240 years after we invaded this country, it's starting to come out now about, you know, this the trauma within the Indigenous is starting to explode, like because it's been held for so long. And so in society, you're now actually starting to see, you know, a lot more of that coming out. And it's the same like with the gangs and everything else. It's like, if you keep turning your back on it and you keep ignoring the fact that we're here and, and there are these issues and we're not going to face into these cultural issues, then they start to form in, in the likes of anger and frustration, which ends up with gangs and drugs and drinking and, you know, violence. Yep. So it, it's, uh, you know, people, st- people don't under, really understand that there is that absolute correlation that societal trauma and individual trauma, there is actually not much difference that, that goes on with that. Um, so yeah, so I think thanks for raising that point because you know we're seeing that in different pockets. I think across the world in, in everywhere else, and then people, it's easy for people to point the finger back at a, a societal group. You know, um, I think in Australia, you know, we've had 
you know, so obviously we had the colonization where there's a lot of, you know, um, Europeans come through. But then, you know, recently it's been the Sudanese. You know, a lot of people coming out from Sudanese into Australia. Next thing, there's all this stuff about all these Sudanese gangs and all this sort of stuff. Thing, But they're just like, we're just trying to fit into society, but you keep bottling us over here. And so they naturally group together. They naturally go into the safety mechanism. They naturally try to support themselves. And then, you know, because they're not seen as humans anymore, you know, they've already been through their own issues that they've brought with them. You know, it's yep. like a relationship. They never dealt with that their own. Now they're into this relationship with Australia and they're just bringing that, those, you know, pre-traumas into this and it's showing up in, we're going to protect ourselves, stick together. Here's the trauma and here's, here's how it's all playing out. So um, I think, yeah, taking, I don't know, I suppose that anthropological view of sitting back and just observing at the macro, it, it's interesting to see how it goes. Um, but anyway, that was a bit of a sidetrack. To, to, to get on back, back onto to that, so, you know, you've gone into a protection mechanism. You've gone, hey, I'm just going to, you know, almost shut out of this high school society because everything that's innate for me to be is good at school, good at sport, good at everything else, I'm going to have to shut down. How does that then transpire for you? Because that that's almost like you're trying to close off a complete part of you. So So how did that show up for you? In, in that like did what what came out of that for you if, if you're going innately i'm a competitive person i love my sport i love it being at the top level i love being at the top level of school but i have to shut it all down from a safety mechanism how, how do you then deal with that is that part of them why you end up sort of pretty much packing up and going off and working or you know and is that why college was different for you later on had no nah, so so right so so if i follow carl young what that did was i started I started hiding who I was. Yeah. Right. Layer after layer of mask after mask, trying to figure out the one that's going to get me to survive. Mm -hmm. The way it manifested was a lot of um, a lot of resentment towards the fam towards the parents, right? Yeah. And basically finding the one or two people I felt safe around that was outside the family. Yep. And you know, spending basically all my time with those with those one or two individuals. Mm. Um, and you know, it worked. So I, I went into, so, so what I went into was rather than, rather than excelling, I went into surviving Yeah. and I found a way to survive. Now, how the problem was, was that, um, surviving didn't work for very long. Um, I was the target of, of, uh, you know, of, of certain gangs and, you know, I was, because I was, um, uh, a white guy dating a Hispanic girl, the Hispanic gang did not like that. Mm -hmm. And I was targeted. Um, and I was attacked multiple times by, okay. by the group until I decided to break up, you know, the, the girl and I decided to, to part ways. Um, I was not alone in that. And that, mm. that was just the nature of our environment. That was our town. I mean, everybody was, was, was targeted. You were, everyone was a target. So the easiest thing to do was, was put on the masks not excel anymore and just go into survival mode. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and and so that's what I did. Now I got lucky. Um because halfway through my 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 high school year, my parents left and moved that moved out of the town. Um they went they went to a a a a more rural, you know, a very rural place in 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 Illinois, which was about 500 people large. Um but I was still with with all the masks that I had on that I didn't want to go. I, I, even though I knew the environment I was in wasn't where I wanted to be, it's where I was and it's what I grew up in. It's what I knew. And I sure as heck didn't want to leave that and go to some place out in some, you know, podunk town where now I'm going to have to find, two, you know, who are my safe people? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. I've got to leave my safe people. And, and I didn't want to do that. So I actually lived with my grandmother for six months. Okay. And what drove me out, um, was while I was having one of my, you know, a typical 16 year old job, which was as a waiter, um, we had closed the restaurant and we were wrapping things up. And at night, um, a person had come in and put a gun to the side of my head to rob the, the restaurant where I was working. Right. And nothing wakes you up more than having a gun touching the side of your head. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, gave the person the, the money, person left. Um, it was at that moment in time that I realized, you know, 
I wasn't ready to go home yet because I, I wanted to prove that I could do this by myself. I didn't need to go back to the family. I could do this. Um, but I know that at that moment in time, you know, I left that job within a, within a week. I went to another job, um, never really was giving it much of anything and just realized it's time, it's time to go, time to go home. Um, and so went up to that school and actually found that there is a different life. Okay. The, the new school that I went to had absolutely nothing, was nothing like where I was. It was easy to make friends. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't have to be tough. I didn't have to be callous. I didn't have to be hard. Um, I actually got back into sports. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, and so it was actually by moving to that town that allowed me to go and get that first job. Cause it's very likely that if I, if I had stayed in that other town, um, I know a lot of kids who didn't make it past 21. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, so just, just for me being able to get out and being able to have a job and earning an actual uh, almost living wage was, was success. I was, mm. I was competing against my old view of what I was going to be and where I was headed. Yeah. Which, which was big. Now, as far as, as far as why was college great? Um, cause I had success. I had success at the job, which was allowing that to come back out. But I also had a vision of where I wanted to go. And I now knew what I needed to do to get there. Mm, okay. And, and so it allowed me to create some very, very strong, um, purposeful goals that I was able to do. And, and again, I was, I was the one holding myself accountable, but by doing this, one thing did occur. Um, as I was going through this was I continued to build into myself this belief and concept of being alone. Yeah. Right. So it was I and I alone who was going to call, allow me to be successful. It was I and I alone who was getting me through these things. Um, and to do that, you know, you, you wind up having to look at yourself. And even though people are trying to help you, you have to tell yourself you're not worth all that all that other external stuff coming to you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So you, so you put those two things on, right. You put those two things on and, and, and now you can, you know, at least now for me, I was able to, to take off and, 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 and head forward and start, start getting back to, for lack of a better term, kicking ass. Yeah. Okay. There, there's an, um, an African proverb, uh, we, which aligns with what you're saying, but it's, um, and I know we want to continue into, you know, there's a transformation piece that, that you've gone through, which is if, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and so it sounds like, you know, you've picked the, the first path of like, right, the fastest way for me to be successful and to, to get to where I want to and hit my goal, and hit my aim is get out there, compete, do it on my own, you know, Put put to be to be honest, probably put masks on. They go, I'm okay. I can look after myself. I can protect myself. I'm okay. I'm you know. I can surround myself. I don't need this person. I don't need that person. You know, I can do all this alone. Um, mm -hmm. And and away you went. And uh, you know, corporate career, career kicks in. Um, so let's sort of move forward. Because I know early on we touched on that corporate career, and now we've touched again on this you know I aspect of you know like yep. I can do this. So what sort of, let's lead up to, to what happened, what took place? Where, where was this piece for you that all of a sudden has gone from maybe it's not about the I and the me and maybe it's a bit about, you know, the we and the others and, and, and the other aspect? Yeah, no, so it, it's interesting um, because even though, so, so now we're going to talk, we're, 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 we're about, we're in the mid to uh, around 2005. Mm-hmm. So the, the corporate landscape has started to shift. And it's no longer about knowledge. Like, mm -hmm. like, yes, knowledge is important, but the ability to work with people starts to become important. Yep. And I'm not good at it. Like, okay. I'm terrible. <laughs> I'm terrible at it. Um, but I'm still being rewarded. But being given these little things of things to work on, right? Um, you know, don't make people cry in a meeting. Uh, you know, type probably stuff. a good thing to work on. <laughs> well, well, but 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 again, in the in the late nineties to early two yeah. thousand, people had, we called it thicker skin. People had thicker skins. You could you could be direct and blunt and look somebody across the table um, and tell them they suck at something. You suck. Mm. 
Mm. This is pathetic. You could say those words. Yeah. Um, and it was not considered harm. It was actually considered standard fare. Um, yeah. Right. I mean, it was not it was not looked down upon early on, but things changed. Mm-hmm. And so as, as things changed, you know, I, I couldn't figure out how to take off those masks. Like I couldn't get back to the to a to, to a place of caring at all. Um, all I could keep doing was saying, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing because I'm still getting rewarded. Yeah. Um, and so what happened was in around 2009, um, I started to lose the use of my left arm. Okay. Woke up one morning and it didn't really want to work. I thought I maybe I heard it lifting weights or something along those lines, maybe slept on it funny. Um, it was at this time at work at the company I was at where I was having my greatest struggles. You know, mm-hmm. you're, when you're sitting on a, on a conference call and your manager's manager says, you know, Brian, you're, you know, you just have to understand you're just an asshole. And, and I'm not mincing words. That's what he said with Gosh. my boss and three other people on the call. And I'm like, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear this. Um, so, so you start to disconnect from it. And then the longer I continued to try to be right, the less and less I was able to use my left arm. And now I left, I left that one company and went to another company where for the first time ever I failed. Okay. Yep. Um, because this company valued um, interpersonal relationships so much that that it was more important than knowledge yeah and for the first time um i was told i was failing as as both a leader and as a, as an employee and that you know left arms locking up even more now because okay. i think yeah. i'll just fight i'll just keep doing i'll just keep working harder um right and i'll just i'll just keep i'll i'll, I'll do it i'll 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 do what you're telling me and i'll go into it and i can change i really can um, I hear you, and because I want to be successful. Yeah, yeah. No, um, year and a half into that organization, it was it was very clear I was not going to survive in that organization. Um, so I took another job with a friend um, who who actually knew me um, from prior work and, and knew knew the warts that I came with, but knew the potential. Brought me into a new brought me into an organization where immediate success happened because I had a lot of experience in what they needed help in. Yeah. My left arm still didn't work. It got to the point to where to get dressed in the morning, I'd have to grab my wrist with my, with my right hand and pull it up over my head. Now, of course, I have never gone to, I, I, I refuse to go to a doctor about it <laughs> because, because I already knew what they were going to tell me, which was you got to do some physical therapy, you blah, blah, blah. I didn't care. I was going to figure out my left shoulder. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. And so I never went in and, and got it looked at, but it got worse and worse to the point where friends and family were very concerned um, that it was going to become frozen. Okay. Because I couldn't, I couldn't do any more than chicken wing it. Yep. Yeah. So I'm working at this company, working at this company, getting accolades, getting getting promoted again, bonuses. I feel like everything's back. I'm, I think I'm happy with myself. And then we go through a program that an external, an external individual brought in called the value leadership program um, where it was, um, it was a program that was, was trying to help people become better leaders. And, and obviously I was still getting the feedback of, you know, if you want to get to the ultimate goal you're looking for um, you're going to have to work on this, this one little thing. And that was not being an asshole. Yep. And, and so, you know, I, I went through the, you know, the normal coaching path. I read all the books. I thought I was doing it. I, you know, you do, you do all the steps and you think you're doing the steps, but you're really not addressing the thing. Yeah, that's right. So, so I was externally taking all the steps, externally doing everything, checking all my boxes, but nah, you know, inside there, there was, there was still the, the masks that wasn't letting who I, you know, who I was come out and 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 yeah. you know it it part of who I was yes I was competitive when I was growing up but as with everybody else you have multiple sides and there was the side of me that was very very um attached to things um you know within nature yeah you know 
I was the kid that had the frog and, you know, had the pets. And that is where I, I put my attachments to. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, as a kid, when the, when the, when the house, when the, when the family cat died, I, I think I cried for like two and a half weeks straight. Mm-hmm. Cause, yeah, yeah. cause that's where it was. And, and, and that's where, that's where, where I had the most connection. Um, but I had hidden that. Okay. Right. You, you sure as heck can't have that going on when you're having guns put to your head. And it wasn't proving itself to be very useful at all in the workplace because, um, you know, you, you couldn't show affection to anyone or, or anything along those lines because then it's weakness. Yes. Yep. Yep. Right. And you can't have that. I can't, I can't right. let anyone know I've got any of those. Um, so what wound up happening was in 2014, went through this program and the program was very focused on aligning yourself okay. to your purpose, to a, to a higher purpose. And then carrying that through, and it's and it and it, what it did it was it was group. Th- I mean, it wasn't called group therapy, but if if you know therapeutic, you know concepts, yeah. it was it was basically group. Um, but the the facilitator was there to help you take your masks off and get back to who you are. Yes. And so one day, um, you know, at the beginning of the of the of the initiative, it was a a nine month initiative. The team had to pick who they wanted leading them. Um, an entire team of, you know, senior executives pick me to lead them. And of course I pat myself on the back. I'm like, hell yeah, I'm going to lead you. Yeah. Who else were you going to pick? Um, <laughs> right. And, and, you know, my, it just, what I didn't realize was that by being the leader, the, the person who was running this, he came up to me after the, after the second day and said, well, you don't realize what your job is. It isn't to lead the way you know to lead. It's to lead as if you are me. Mm. And I didn't know what that meant, right? As far as I was concerned, this was some, you know, cast off hippie. Yeah, yeah Talking yeah, about, yeah. you know, talking about peace and love and all this stuff. And I'm like, whatever. Um, but I will admit I was somewhat intrigued because the first time I stepped into the shoes that he asked me to step into um, was in a room where he asked me just to sit and listen. So as you met, you know, and I was in a room with 50 people. No, was it? No. It was 50 people was the overall team size. So there was about maybe 20, 25 people mm-hmm. in the room. They were all paired up. And he asked me to sit in the middle of the room and just listen. And as I did, what I found was I could actually hear the whispering conversations of everybody throughout this room. Yeah. If I paid attention and just stayed quiet. And I could hear what was saying what was being said. And, uh, you know, part of that exercise was a limiting belief, you know, getting, you know, it was, it was transforming a limiting belief into a, to, to, a, to, a, to a new, you know, a new belief that would, that would mot- that would push you forward towards your goal. And of course I did the exercise and I did it half-assed, um, because, you know, there was no way I was putting the real ones down. Yeah. Um, and I sure, because, because I wasn't going to talk through it, but I was finding that, as they were using, as he was using methods and using things that the real ones were, were bubbling. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So I went home. Um, it was the third end of the third day and I walked around the lake. And I, at that point, moment in time, I was, I, I had a small place on a lake because I was living away from my family. Um, to take this job, I had to leave my family, you know, newborn daughter, two, two young boys starting a new school. It didn't matter. I had okay. to go earn this living. Yep. And so while walking around the lake, I got honest with myself. And I couldn't, I could not stop the emotions that just came flowing out. Yep. Yeah. Couldn't stop them. Half a mile walking, couldn't stop them. Got into the house, found any piece of paper I could. And so what I found was a receipt for dry cleaning. And I wrote down my real limiting beliefs, which was, I wasn't worthy of love. I was all alone. Um, and those two yeah. things, you know, are what I wrote down. Yeah. Very, uh, I wrote- yeah. So I was going to say that, that's a very profound, uh, landing point on, on those two things. And it's, uh, yeah, it, it's not uncommon. And, but I think that's because people have all these masks. They're not willing to actually allow that, that to come in. So sorry, continue on. 
No, no. So, so the only the only part I was gonna I was gonna get to you know, say is that. So the next morning, I woke up. My left arm was one hundred percent functional. Yep. <laughs> it's I mean, when I, and so when I say functional, I don't need, I don't mean like there were aches or or clicks. It was one hundred percent functional. Mm. And so I went to the person, um, you know, who was who was who was who was basically becoming my mentor at this point, and I just looked at. Him, I said, "What the hell did you do to me?" <laughs> and he asked why, and I told him, you know, the experience of being able to hear everybody, and now my left arm works. And we got into, um, you know, the concepts and and of of the energetic blocks of the masks, and this was my introduction to it. Yeah. Uh, of of how your mental your your mental blocks will create potentially physical blocks, and as you start to align yourself, um, as you start to remove the fears that you have, and as you really start to understand what your purpose is, and you start to work towards that, these things, these, these, these material manifestations go away. And not only do they go away, you start to be able to have interactions at a higher level. Yes. And so overnight, I went from a, a doubter a denier to an immediate believer because I had no choice but to believe believe my arm worked. That's right. You had the empirical evidence to support that something had taken place. Yes. Something had taken place. And I and I did feel lighter, right? And so the interesting part is throughout the rest of that program, um, you know, I became more and more in tune with what he was teaching. And a lot of what he was teaching, you know, if if you talk, you know, you talk um you know, there's a lot of Buddhist concepts in it. There's a lot of, a lot of, um, not a lot of meditating, not a lot of the yoga stuff, but just mm -hmm. a lot of, a lot, a lot of aligning your purpose, stay true to your purpose and start connecting. Yeah. Um, and as I did more and more of it, I found it easier and easier to lead. Mm. Now the, now the interesting part was the company I was at who brought these, this person in and who believed and wanted us, all of the leaders to go through this. I found very quickly they didn't support it once you started bringing it back to the company. Right. Okay. Um, they spoke a good game, but they didn't actually allow you to implement it. So yeah. much so that so so much so that even though the person that I was working with had said, "All right, I'm going to mentor you in this now. You have you have caught on, and this is something that that you have a knack for and a skill for." Um, my manager said I actually failed the uh, the program. <laughs> and Strange. well, not really, because because that person had not let go of their masks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair they right. had not let go. They had not become what what was what was potentially there for them. Mm. And you know, it was it was one of those situations where I where you know I was very confused at the moment. I'm like, how the heck can someone tell me I failed this? This we we did something never before seen. There was an entire, you know, 300 person wide multinational party that was going on celebrating the success of this program. How can you say I failed? And you know, it I had to I had to look at it and say, wait a minute. That's he's allowed to have that opinion, mm. but that opinion isn't who I am. Only I know if I was really doing well. Only I know, you know, am I being honest with myself and with others? Only I know my intent. Um, and if a person's going to have those blocks up, they're actually not going to be able to engage at that level. Yes, that's right. And so for me, what wound up happening was I stayed at the company for a couple more years. They tried to put me in some different places because, again, they can see the success they understand what's happening. They see that I've changed, but now the change has gone too far. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, because now, now I'm at the point where I'm actually able to elevate myself to to areas where it scares them. Mm, yes. Yes. It puts them at risk. It threatens them. Yeah, it threatens what they're trying to do. You even though it's exactly what they asked to have happen. 
yeah, you've now become a big mirror for them and they're not that they're they're not comfortable with what they're seeing in the mirror. Exactly. And not not only that, um, I wasn't afraid anymore. Yeah, yeah. And so um, you know, I was more than willing to not just be the mirror for them, but actively reflect. Mm. Yeah. So 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 it became something where um where in the end it was a recognition that it was time to me to go. Yep. And I was happy with it. I was comfortable. And 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 part of it was, you know, a week early, it, it wasn't even a matter of them telling me it was time to leave. Um, I knew it was time to leave. I had already put out into the, you know, the the universe, it was time for me to leave. And that was driven by um my daughter at the time who woke up and and every Every Monday, I would wake up at four in the morning, and I would go to I would drive off to to the office, you know, my the small house that I had up up and away, and I would come home Friday night, um, and during the week I was gone. And my daughter came up to me, and she'd never done this before, you know, woke up with me at four in the morning, and was bawling her eyes out, saying, "Don't go." Right. Mm. That was hard. Mm. That's, right, that's hard. really hard to take in. Um, but at that moment, as I was driving up to the work, I'm like, why? What am I? This I, I belong again. I belong back home. Yeah. It's yeah. time to go yeah. back home. Um, I didn't tell anybody about the story, but within a week. It was time for me to leave. Hmm. And we had come to a mutual agreement. I was I was able to leave. We left amicably. Um but from there, I realized it was time to actually start bringing what it is that I've done and I've learned and I've, I'm doing myself and bring it to others. Okay. Yeah. So I made the decision that going forward, this is how I was going to live. Now, am I perfect? No. <laughs> it's a constant, right? It's a constant battle. Yes. Um, and it's, it's a constant struggle. And the minute, the minute you start thinking that you've got it all figured out, you know, you're going to get hit right upside the head because, because you don't. And right. I learned that a couple of times. Um, but I also learned um, very quickly that if you don't live true to the way you went, there are external forces that will come and remind you of that. So, um, go ahead. No, no, no I, I, I fully agree with what you're saying on that aspect. Um, I, I want to, you know, continue on, on with the story with you, but there's just a couple of things again that you spoke of a little bit earlier. Uh, first of all, um, you know, I was brought up in, in a Catholic, I, I believe, in a, a higher creator than an individual God level now because that's where I've, yeah, feel I've transcended to. But I love this one story, and this is where people get for me a bit confused in religion about the fact of these are just beautiful stories. So doubting Thomas, right? And so this whole thing of you know when Jesus was resurrected. Thomas had to see physically that Jesus had resurrected. And as he said, blessed are those who, who believe without seeing, right? Mm -hmm. And so you went through that physical piece of it took you from a Downing Thomas point of view to physically see your shoulder just magically recover as soon as you got into energetic alignment with who you are. Um, for me, I had a similar experience where – my right elbow, I went through everything. I just could not get rid of the pain in my right elbow. Um, I was doing a lot of boxing and I just basically in the end, I'm in the gym and I'm just throwing lefts. That's all I'm doing. I'm hooking, I'm mm -hmm. jabbing. Like I could not even throw a right. My elbow was that sore. Went to, you know, acupuncture, chiros, pick everything. The one car I went to, I walked in the door and he's gone, dude, you got dad issues go and solve for your dad issues. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, he goes, go and do this, write a letter, send it to your dad. And in the end, as the universe does, I, I'd written a letter and, uh, and I was meant to go and send it to him. But because the, the next very next weekend, I was meant to be working all weekend. But the work I was doing, they cancelled. So all of a sudden, I have a, not only have done this, I have a free weekend, hop in the car, drive to my dad, so I'm coming down, I need you to read this letter. And it was all the things that I had struggled with my dad. My elbow fixed. Like I'm back throwing right crosses and I'm back throwing, you know, solid right punches again, like within a week of doing that sort of thing. So me, 
again, there's this logical part of my brain. I, I, I completely align with the energetic. I completely align with, you know, the how our body stores, you know, all bad emotions and all traumas and, and you know, and if we're not in alignment, it will sharpen a physical pain somewhere. Yep. And my wife's beautiful at doing that. We've got this book, which is effectively all about, um, you know, if you're feeling pain in any part of your body, it's a lady by the name of Ina Segal. And uh, Ina Segal, and basically if you go, if I've got a pain in the shoulder or somewhere else, go and grab the book and it'll tell you what's happening in your life emotionally that you need to deal with. And so, you know, it's, it's an amazing book. And, and But the thing is there's so many doubting Thomases that have to physically have gone through as you said, for us that we both went through to go, oh fuck, there might actually be something to this, <laughs> <laughs> you know, releasing yeah. of, of this this held up trauma. Um, so yeah, what, so if so, you don't mind me asking, what who's the author? Because I I got the Carolyn Mice, I think it's Mice is how you pronounce your name books mm. that do the same thing. I was wondering if it's the same author, if there's something different. No, it's a different author. Her name's Ina Segal, which is I double N A S E G A L. Um, I should know the name of it. It's a yellow book. <laughs> like it's available <laughs> on Amazon um, because we keep joking around whenever something happens in our life, because this, my, my wife has been on this for a lot longer than me. And as soon as something pops up, she, you know, me and my kids go, oh, fuck, mom's going to go to the yellow book again, <laughs> which we yep. love, right? And I'm a, I'm a promoter. Like I'm at work and people go, oh, my knee's really playing up. I'm like, let me send you something about what's happening with you emotionally. <laughs> like, and they go, no, no, I've got to go and see a doctor. It's my old sports injury. Yeah. No, nah, it's not. But anyway, no. it's uh... <laughs> no, it's not. Um, it's amazing how much it's not. Yes, um, correct. It, it is amazing how much. And and again, I, it, it, could it be? Sure. I mean, sure, you can have real physical damage. Mm. What I found was, um, and this was the interesting part. And as I got mentored more, was how to how to reverse real damage. Yes. So one of the one of the uh, the events while I was still working in the one office was, and, and again these things scared the people that I worked with was, I had wa- worn a pair of contacts for way too long, and you know I put them in and my eye got infected, mm. and so I took them out and you know if you've ever seen anybody with an infected eye the entire eye was blood red. Mm, yeah. Yes. And everyone was looking at me at nine in the morning and they're saying, you know, Brian, you've got to, you got to go to see a doctor that, that doesn't look at them. And I looked and I went, I pulled it open and I saw, and I said, okay, I got it. And I said, it's, it's not an infection. And I said, it's an infection, but I, I know what's causing it. And then the problem was, was, um, you know, I, I wasn't being honest with my boss about something. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I started to be honest, you know, you know, started to, to treat my boss well. Um, started it to, 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 again, live more like, like who I was supposed to be, but I was very focused on my eye and making sure that I was also bringing in what I had learned, which was the, the healing energies in mm-hmm. and focus them within the eye throughout the day, people were watching what was once a bright red eye slowly move back to clear. And by the end of the day, I was my eye was 100% healed. Yeah. Um, my relationship with my boss was 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 healed. Um, and I was where I needed to be at that moment. I, I felt good in the moment at that moment in time. Um, and so I started to learn and, and tell very quickly when I was going to be getting physical ailments just by how it is that I was acting and interacting and whether I was doing or not doing what I was supposed to be doing within with, yeah. within my purpose. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, so, so, um, when people saw that, right. So it's one thing for me to talk about things and for people to say, wow, you've really changed. But when they see, when, when they hear me talk about, you know, no, this is bigger than just, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a decent person. There's something bigger going on. As you said, doubting Thomas's, um, they don't want to doubt that they, they don't want to, they don't want to see that mm. because then they've got to address, wait a minute we all went through this same training. Why am I not doing what? Nope. I don't want that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, so, you know, it was very easy to start feeling the resistance, feeling the barriers being put up. And what I had to learn with, what I had to learn now was how to live this new way. Um, because once you start connecting with these things, um, you, you, you can turn them off, but I didn't want to turn them off. Yes. Yeah. 
I, I wanted to continue to interact um, in this manner. I wanted to continue um, to to interact with with guides. I wanted to continue to be able to have conversations that went beyond just you know the you know sitting across from somebody conversations. And I and I liked um, who I was becoming. And yeah, yeah. and I was very it was becoming very clear to me what I should be doing with my time here. And I will tell you, Milvo, it saved my life two months ago. Okay. Let's talk to that one then. How, how does that work for you? So I I had gone so so I had gone to Vegas yep. for a for a work session. It was um I was receiving an award and um it was a, an award slash networking event. Out in, out in Las Vegas. It's the first one I'd ever been to. And so I went out there and, you know, it's with a bunch of doctors and people in the medical field and the mental health field. Um, you know, I'm sitting there next to people who are heads of heads of departments, head of medical departments at universities and, you know, doctors. And I'm just sitting there, you know, former, former executive current coach, right? That that's yeah. who I am. I'm that's, I've, I've got none of the accolades, but at the end of day three, this person who who looked like, you know, number one, did not belong in the in the event, but just walked into the event, dressed, looked like a bag lady mm -hmm. and started asking doctors questions. And I remember sitting there going, who is this person and why are you asking this? You're at the last day. Let us get out of here. But there was a reason that that person came in. I didn't know what it was, but I knew I needed to go talk to that person. Mm -hmm. So I spent a couple of hours talking with this person. Um, this person took me all around Vegas and, and I learned what, um, you know, I was interested in what this person does um, with, with her company. And she was very interested in what I do because um, she gave, asked me to do a five minute thing of, show me what you do. And so I showed her what I did and she said, all right, we need to keep in touch. I said, all right. So I went back from Vegas. And again, I was more interested in thinking that I was supposed to be there to connect with these medical doctors yeah. and, and that type of stuff, not realizing it's this woman I was actually supposed to connect with. I, I didn't mm -hmm. quite have that clarity. But when I came back from Vegas, within two days, um, I got sick. And I, you know, I, I have clients here, I, you know, and, and every morning I was waking up to go to, to go to work, you know, and work was still in the house, is still in the house, but I was getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Um, but I kept thinking it was just a cold. Yeah, okay. And yeah. I was going to get better. Yep. Wound up being that um, I had caught the Delta variant. Okay. And unlike those where it's a it's a sniffle and you get over it, for me it was advancing. Yeah, okay. Yep. Um and when I caught it, which was late June, early July, they weren't really pushing treatments. And so the mm -hmm. doctor's message was. You're just going to have to go home and fight it. Okay. After a week of fighting it, I started to have the conversations with, with, with the guides where I was being given two choices. Either get real, get behind what you're supposed to be doing while you're here, or leave. Mm -hmm. And by leaving, it was, you can come with us now. Right. Okay. And so it took me a couple of days. I mean, it took me a couple of days. And, you know, when you're going through that, um, mm -hmm. unable to eat, unable to drink. And, you, and if you talk with folks, they'll say, oh, you were delirious from fever. You were delirious from hunger. Nope. I know what I was. Yeah. Yep. Um, I know what choices I was being given. Mm -hmm. I know who I was interacting with. Yep. Um, and I made a choice and the choice was yeah, I'm here to, to stay. But when I made the choice to stay, the message was, Oh, really? That morning um, I woke up and, you know, if, if, if anyone, you know, follows the medical side of it, you know, you get these oxygen, oxygen saturation levels that are typically in the high nineties mm -hmm. within four hours, mine had dropped from 98 down to 79, which required yeah. immediate, immediate care. I had gone into um, acute respiratory failure. Yep. And so now I'm sitting here having to ask for help. I can't be alone. Mm. I'm not going to survive if I'm alone. 
call the ambulance, ambulance comes. I never wanted to go to the doctor. I haven't seen a doctor in, in almost two decades. Yeah. And, and like I didn't go when my arm didn't move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no escaping this one. Um, go in, uh, start to receive, you know, just oxygen supplements, some, some, some additional drugs, things of that nature. But while I was in the hospital, um, had a lot more interactions, a lot more conversations. Um, people from around the world. Yeah. Um, people who didn't know I was in there saying, I need, I felt this need, I needed to contact you. What's going on? Oh, I'm in mm-hmm. the hospital dying of COVID. Um, I knew I wasn't dying anymore at that point. I knew that I was coming out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Family didn't know that. Yeah. Wife doesn't know that, right? Wife doesn't know that I've had this conversation, that I've made this decision. All mm-hmm. she sees is a, is a guy getting weaker and weaker and weaker, um, fading away, um, unable to breathe. And she's getting the messages from the doctors that things aren't on the up and up. Um, but by the third day, I I'd already had all the conversations I needed to have. I already had all the interactions. I now know and have committed to where it is that I'm headed, that I took the oxygen off in the middle of the night and everything remained stable. Okay. And the doctors came in, they said, you can't do that. And I said, but I did. And they had expected me to be there for at least two weeks. They were already prepping for me to go into something more severe. And here I am now ready to walk out. Mm, yeah. And so, you know, being able to, 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 to not only align with who I was, but to recognize it, to be able to have those interactions and make that active conscious choice of where I was headed, um, I truly believe saved me. Mm. Okay. Because had I not done that, it would have been very easy for me to have lied in that bed. Because you've heard of you've heard about the guy, the people with COVID that you know they go to bed and they don't wake up. Yep. You know they went to bed seeming fine, and then they they wake up and they just don't wake up. Um, I was headed down that path. Had I not chosen to wake up, had I not chosen to do those things, I would not have I would not have survived because my oxygen levels had dropped so low that I was already at risk of a massive stroke. Mm. And they were, they did not, they did not like plateau. It yes. just kept, every time I measured myself with a, with a, with a home device, it was dropping and dropping fast. Okay. So, so I just, for the listeners out there, because you haven't specifically talked into this and, and you know, I know exactly where you're at. So the conversations and correct me if I'm wrong here, but the conversations Brian's having is actually with effectively spirits, ancestors at a, um, non-physical level and a non-mental level so my my, i'm taking the conversations you're having is that you're actually having um energetic conversations with with people that you're actually calling in um you know and so other people might think in the world of clairvoyant type of thing so you're actually calling in external worlds external realms and people that are in other realms from an energetic point of view and seeking counsel and direction from them as to what does the path look like for you? And they're pretty much saying, well, you can come with us, you can leave this world and come come across into the new realm, or you can stay in that world, which, what do you want to do? And where's your choice? And so you're actually effectively, if I'm right, talking, um, you know, um, in people within, you know, as I said, spirits or different realms. Is that correct? Yeah, it's it's hard for me to explain what it is because Mm -hmm. I'm not going to pretend to know yeah. what that realm is. Um, it is definitely, it is definitely an energetic conversation. Yep. What I still do not know is whether I was talking with my ener- my true pure energetic self. Yep. Whether I was talking to the, the manifestation of the concept of a singularity. Like I, I, I won't, pre- there's a lot of different theories about who, who it is that I, I am interacting with. Mm. Um, but I am having those those conversations with both those in, in, in different planes and also with those in this plane. Mm, yeah. Um, so the interesting part is, you know, is that while I was in in my state, um, a constant voice kept coming to me, which was the word help. Yeah. By the third day, I had figured out who the voice was. And it was a very old friend that I had not spoken with since 1996. Okay. And so after I got myself finally stable back home doing what I needed to do for me, I texted that person, found found their number, texted that person and said hi. And person was very surprised to hear from me and said hi. 
Lisa just said, do you need to talk? And, and and she said, yes. And we hadn't spoken since 1996. Um, picked up the phone. Um, and by the end of the conversation, um, had, had gotten to the point to why, why it was that she was reaching out. She was also hospitalized with COVID at the exact same time, um, struggling with a decision about what to do. Mm, and yep. she didn't ask me specifically for help. She had just screamed from internally help. Yes. And I picked it up. So um, that is one of the things that I had learned how to do through the mentor, which was learn how to have conversations with people, even in this realm, on, on this plane, mm. but using um, methods and mechanisms of, of being able to pick up on, on devocalized uh, words. So I will not use the word telepathy. Uh, yeah. I, I don't, it, because it's, it, it's, it's the... It's the wares of, um, you know, of, of the charlatan many times. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not something where, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know, Johnny Carson, I can, I can read your mind, but I can interact. And yeah. I've been learning, you know, that's part of what I was learning how to do when you start reading these types of messages that are out within, within the world, the physical world and the, and the metaphysical world. Yeah. Uh, look, so f- from my aspect, um, you know, and, and even from the listener's aspect, so my brother-in-law um, is a very spiritually connected guy and, and he he has been able to transcend outside of this world and actually like he, him and, he, him and my sister-in-law moved closer to my father-in-law because they knew he only had a, a year or so to live. Like they already knew the messaging and had already come to them. Yeah. And by listening to the message, they moved close and, and because they'd had a young son, had this opportunity for their son to get to know his granddad, you know, in the last few years that they actually had. Um, and so I know in, in scenarios that I've been through, I've had a an uncle and, and a grandfather both come to me and, you know, talk to me about, you know, things are okay and this is now what you've got to do and, and everything else. So, the the element of it is about we all have this is the interesting thing you know and, and a lot of the reading i've been doing lately is about you know universal consciousness and the fact that there yeah. is just one consciousness across the world and that we have the ability to tap into that and so when people see good things happening to certain people all the time and you know bad things happen to people all the time it's like what are you calling in and what, where are you connecting to what, what you're connecting to and the level that you move to, these things will turn up. People will come in your life. These opportunities will come along. And so, you know, for me, what you're just explaining is exactly that. It's that, it's that the more that we can turn off, if you like the logical intellect element of it yeah. and actually understand that what we what we can tap into is not logic and it's not intellectual. It's actually at a very deep energetic conscious level and actually slowly just take off the mask there in our day-to-day corporate work and our day-to-day work. We don't have to walk around saying, I'm talking to spirits left, like et cetera, or hang on a minute, let me make this business decision. Hang on. I'm going to call in the great one to make this business decision. Well, I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying how you live in your everyday life. And the more you become more and more open to the fact that, just globally how much is happening at the same time. I mean, for us, even while we're talking here, if we think about exactly what's happening across the world at the same time with animals, with insects, with birds, with people, you know, you and I are talking straight to the US, but what's happening in all the other continents, there's just this one level of we're either feeding into this level of consciousness or we're detracting from it. And, And where do we want to sit and how do we want to operate and connect into that? I'm finding it fascinating. I'm 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 a project manager by trade. I'm a process driven, logical driven guy, um, and so this is my challenge. To it's exactly where you're at. This is my challenge in the world is to say, how can I turn off this fifty year driven brain that's been proven by logic? You know, the doubting Thomas, these sorts of things of my limiting beliefs. How can I start to turn them off and just surrender into? and allow allow the fact that when that message comes through it is actually going to come through and that person as you said that person will appear in your life you know they they had a message for you did were you open to what that message was were you open to hear it whether it be 
verbally or even energetically? What what did you mm-hmm. pick up on that? So look, I'm I love where you're at because um, I think that's such a beautiful spot to be in. Um, being able to tap in, in, into that space is just yeah, absolutely awesome. Uh, it's it's um it is interesting. Like you said, it's uh you know you start talking about the the universal energetic knowledge and and presence. Um, what, what's what's surprising to me is is uh, and it, 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 for some reason it's always surprising to me is um, when you do pay attention um, how the doors fly open. Mm. So I mentioned the the lady from Vegas, and, and the reason I mentioned the lady from Vegas was back in 2016 when when I left the other company and I'd come back. Um, I was talking with my with my mentor at the time, and we were talking about. He's like, "Well, so Brian, what are you going to do?" And I had been given the message and believed in these the concept of these things called agrihoods, which is these self sustaining, you know, building these self sustaining communities that grow a large majority of their own foods, not a commune, not like a 1960s commune, yeah, 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 but a, yeah. but a, but a, you know where you still you still shower, you still have so, right. um, <laughs> but. But the concept was was to start allowing areas, you know, because there's a lot of wasted land, mm. um, and start finding ways to bring these self-sustaining communities together. So I had these ideas back in, you know, 2016. Um, did a little bit of research. There wasn't a lot out there on it. And he asked me, he said, "Well, how how are you going to bring value to the world with it?" I said, well, "What do you mean? How am I going to? I clearly want to bring value." He's like, "All right, well, that's good. It's a, it's a good concept." And of course, I walked away going, yeah, it's a good concept. And so I started trying to, to find the standard ways of making it happen, thinking, well, I'm going to make this happen now. It's, it's, it's something I, I'm here for. I know I'm here for this. So I worked with, you know, I talked with developers. I ran for political office to get on boards and all this stuff. And I just all kept getting shut down. And I'm like, what the heck? Fine, I'll go back to being a consultant in the insurance mm-hmm. industry. I'll still do all this coaching stuff. I'm going to go go earn a living being a consultant, which I did. Um, you know, still still consulting over there. But in Vegas, there was this need to go talk to this person. So I went and talked with this person. Wound up being that the company that she runs is right now in the process of bringing all the technologies together to make these types of communities happen. Right. However, she was blocked. And the reason she asked me to be involved with her was for me to actually not consult with her from an insurance standpoint, but to actually help her unblock. Um, and, you know, and be a partner with her, not be, um, you know, be someone with her by her side, part of her team. Mm. And in doing that within, we're at the end of month two. When I first met her, um, she had a couple of pieces of land and a number of people who were interested in being a part and bringing some technologies together, but no idea how to do it. Talking about how do we get the word out? How do we get the message out? Um, and, 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 and working with her, talking with her and helping her now start to elevate and start to connect to this same thing. Um, she now has people knocking at her door with hundred million dollar projects that they want her and her technology team to come solve for them. Right. So just yesterday she was on a call. She said, guys, I, I got to hang up because I'm about to go into a room and there's $50 million of grant money on the line right now. And they want to talk with me. Crazy. And, and so when talking with her, you know, when, when we, when her and I've been talking, we've been talking about, do you see the doors? Do you see the people who are now coming into your life? And yes, there's things that you have to let go. There's people who have who have wronged you, people that you feel that you've you've been cheated by. But if you hold on to that, you know that's it's that's what's going to continue to happen. You're going to get continue to get cheated. You hold on to that hostility. You continue to write. And we even got to the point where we were talking about how do you write your speech? How do you ha- how do you have your TED talk? How do you write the 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 one minute blurb? And if in there you're confrontational, if in your in there you're talking about, you know, and, and one of the phrases that was constantly in there is like, well, we're going to break chains. And I said, well, what happens if you're actually building links? Mm. And, you know, start start having those types of conversations and start saying, you know, there's always the reframe, right? And, and people hate it. 
because it's corporate speak, you know, oh, you got to reframe that. And you, it's not a problem. It's an opportunity. And, and you know, people hate that crap. They, they, they hate it, but they hate it because they don't believe it. Yes. And, and if you actually start saying, you know what, you're right. I'm not going to break a chain. The chain is there. I'm going to build a link. I'm going to build something. I'm going to construct something. I'm going to be, you know, and, and whatever, whatever comes of it, I'm going to pay attention and I'm going to build that next thing. Um, when you start talking in those ways, you find people become much more attached, right? If you're building a link, people will attach. You break a chain while well, you're separating yourself from someone. Yes. So, you know, it, it, it got to the point to where just working verbally, not just to say the words, because the whole concept of fake it till you make it doesn't work. No, that's right. You, you've got to connect. Um, and so her and I connected, right? It was, it was a guide. Um, mm. It was, you need to go talk to this. And she did look like a, and we joked, we still joke to this day that she came in. And the reason she looked like a bag lady is she had been out surfing, you know, in the morning. And she just had to grab whatever clothes was in her trunk, You're which fine. which in, which included like yoga shorts, um, a, a, a flannel she tied around her waist, like a star child hat and, you know, a, a T-shirt with with like, you know, military boots on. Yeah. He just comes walking in to a, to a place, you know, hadn't been there all week and just starts asking questions and walks out like you got to go talk to her. Um, and I heard you got to go talk to her. So I went and talked to her. Mm. Um, we're now at that point where not only do we are we starting to get funding, but we're about to um, break ground to start building the first of these. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so it's right. So it's it's a unified vision. Yeah. Now, not everybody's on board with the vision. Not everybody wants to live this way, but that's OK. Mm, yeah. At, but at this moment, the groups that are have come together and are going to be building this. Um. So I just I just put that out as an example of 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 not just a singular right because a lot of times people will look at it and say well you're talking with this and you know I want to go back to you're not alone right the thing that I had to let go was it's going to require this whole group of collectives mm. um, you can you can believe we're individuals or you can believe we're all a singular you know coming from a singular source now finding each other working together however you want to look at it however people want to believe it is you know, is always is always open to interpretation that the human mind can't wrap itself around this right now. Um, but the key is, can you tap it? And are you yeah. are you willing to tap it? And are you willing to hold true to it? Because if you are, um, every single person that I've that that I've 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 come into contact with in this manner has found the ability to do so. So it's not even just like an individual, like oh, you're special, and. No, we all have it. It's all there. That's right. Are you are you are you ready to open it up? And if you are, be prepared for the stuff that comes at you. Um, it, it's okay to be scared because yeah. it's scary. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's really weird when you start. And and I'll admit the the one time that I got scared out of my mind was when I was starting to get messages in languages I'd never spoken before, and I went to Google and typed in the words. Um. And it came back as legit messages from from different languages. Right. Okay. And they were legit statements that were. I'm like, yep. oh, I I I've got to go do that. Okay. Um, you know, I I don't I don't speak Portuguese. I don't speak you know the language of of Indonesia. Mm. But I knew the words, and I went and typed them in, and sure enough, Google, yep. Google Translate's great. I'm not alone. Google Translate. It told me what I needed to know because I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, but just spot on on that. I mean, that's the other thing too. Is like you know, well, <laughs> the messages aren't like English is just a language that we've chosen to to run with, right? But the, you know, there's multiple languages and there's multiple ways to get this message. I know, you know, of people who you know wake up in the middle of the night, like they just wake up and they grab and the pen and the paper and they just jot down whatever actually happened in the night, then they go back to sleep. And they get up the next morning and they look in the tub and they go, holy shit, like what have I written down? Or, you know, and some of this is hieroglyphics and some of this is just different things. And then they do the research and they go, holy cow, like I don't even know that language. I don't even know that symbolism. I don't even know that. But something came to me. I got up 
and I just wrote down what was in that. And there's some massive, powerful messaging that uh, that comes off the back of that. And as I said, it's about for me. There's two things that, that runs in here. One is if you go into you know build the link, as you say, so we're not breaking the chain. We're building the links. If you don't believe it, then you're breaking the chain. Mm-hmm. If you the if you it's about the intent that you're actually putting into it. It's the intent that makes it true. So if you if you're doing it but you're doubting it, then you're not actually doing it. You're still coming from the wrong level of limiting belief and and doubting and everything else. Yep. So you've got to go at it with the right intent. And then the other element of that is then to surrender to the outcome. Don't determine what the outcome is. Put the intent in. Because even though you may want an outcome, how the universe decides to deliver that outcome back to you, just allow it to come back in as long as the intent that you're putting out is the main thing. Do it with intent, do it with full belief, and then surrender to the outcome. And and you'll be surprised about what, how it comes back because what's probably going to come back at you may have been bigger, larger, wider, but then, as you said, be open to how it comes back. Be willing to open up to how that message is presented in front of you. Don't be dismissive. Don't go, but that's not quite right because I thought it was going to be like this. You know, that's going to come back into you and, and go from there. Um, I know you've been extremely generous with your time because I know that, um, you know, as, as you and I had a bit of a chat about before we, we kicked off the recording, it's like, hey, look, I try to keep this around about this time, but if we're having a beautiful conversation, we're just going to keep letting it run. But but I know that uh, it's probably starting to get uh, a bit late over where you are. And um, and so I know that we could continue to probably talk for a long time on this. And you know, I'm a sort of person like yourself who could, we could just engage in these conversations probably for many, many hours. Um, but yeah, I'm conscious of my listeners and that uh, you know, I want them to be able to, you know, I uh, have a podcast that they feel they can listen to, get enough of the messaging out there, and then they know where to come to find you if they want to ask other questions and they can come track you down. So one of the things I like to just have at the end, this has been a little bit different because I haven't really got into maybe some of the previous traumas and everything else but others, but what's a message you feel that you could leave, you know, uh, whether it be men or the females or different things that's out there, particularly in the in the space that you're talking about? What's lots of a message that you you might put out there just to summarize your thoughts about where people, what they could actually do to maybe, you know, open up their lives or, or change how they want to, to, to operate. So, so the message that I would give, and, and we, we hit on it here towards the end, which is um, some way, shape or form, find a way to Believe in something. Because it starts there. Um, There's tips and there's techniques and tricks to find your purpose. Don't dismiss it. It's it's what you just mentioned. You know, don't dismiss your purpose. Know that you're here. And whether whether you're Christian or Muslim or agnostic or atheist, you're here for a reason. And here on this planet, people are here to help you. We're here to help each other. Find them and enjoy yourself because it's right there waiting for you to take it. It's not hiding. And if you just will, if you just open up, you will find yourself in a in a much more positive um, state than you are, and in a constructive state and a more fulfilled state. And in a very simplified state too. That would be my message. Awesome. Thank you. I think that's such a beautiful message to to finish on on with. Um, I've really enjoyed this conversation. It's uh it, it, it there's been parts of this conversation we've had with others, but I think you've just brought it together beautifully about your journey and about what that looks like. Um for me it looks like you're on an amazing path. Um you're certainly listening uh, energetically. You're open to what's coming to you. Um, it doesn't feel like you have a predefined path moving forward now. You, you have a view about where you're going, but not predefined. And I really love that because I know it's something that I'm looking to become more and more open to. And so I have personally have enjoyed this conversation because it's helped me reaffirm the journey that I'm heading on. 
And um, so again, it's, you know, universally, you know, you tapped out on Podmatch, I tapped in on it, you know, and, uh, you know, we've now had this great conversation, which I'm like, excellent, you know, um, and you and I wouldn't have come across each other path if we certain things hadn't aligned. So it's, it's been great. Um, so thank you, Brian, for you know, being as open and honest um, as, as you've been. It's, you know, sometimes people are a bit nervous about getting to this level of honesty. Um, so I really do appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, you went to all those different places and I'm sure my listeners will uh, enjoy listening to your message. So thank you. Um, have a beautiful evening over in Connecticut. Um, hope you enjoy whatever is the dinner fair for you. Um, and uh, take care. And I really look forward to uh, touching base with you and, and watching your journey as we move forward. Thank you, Milbo. I enjoyed this. This was wonderful. Definitely appreciate it. Excellent, man. All right. Have a great night and uh, we'll chat again soon. Cheers. All right. See you. Hey, all. So uh, that was a fantastic chat. I, I just absolutely uh, loved hearing that, that, that story and, and Brian's journey um, as he's gone along. Um, you know, there was just so many, I, I think, just similarities. And, and, and so for me, where I'm at, just, just hearing that, you know, again, I, I think we're not alone. Like some of the things that Brian spoke about and, and there was just so much alignment to my life. I'm like, yeah, I'm not alone in this. I, I, I'm, I'm on a similar path in, in, in many different ways, you know, whether it be the, the physical aspect or whether it be the competitive aspect or, you know, tapping into the energy. So, you know, this is why these conversations are so beautiful because you just get to meet these awesome people and you go, shit, I'm not in this together. So. I love that. Um, and again, I just want to thank Brian for his openness and his transparency on, on the conversation. Um, so that'll be a wrap. So episode 46 of the Unearthed Man podcast, uh, we'll wrap it up there. As I said earlier, look, I'd love for people to subscribe and certainly please leave a review. Um, if you're really enjoying this, you know, putting out reviews, one, it gets the opportunity for the podcast to be put up in front of other people who may not be aware of it. But cool, oh, yeah, I don't mind a bit of validation here and there either to you know, get the feedback that we're doing a good job. Um, as you know, you can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. So that's it for episode 46 of the Unearthed Man podcast. Take care, everybody, and uh, chat soon. Much love. Mm-hmm.